Okay, my friends, we've reached the end of what I hope you've found to be an entertaining and enjoyable and educational experience. Uh, this last module, module 12, covers chapter 31 in your textbook, and this is, of course, right up my alley. It's weather, and that is my area of, of I guess, expertise, at least that's the area of my, my most training. Uh, I spent six years as a TV weatherman, four years I worked for USA Today, and actually in this, in this uh, lecture mix, I'm going to pepper in a lot of graphics that I developed at USA Today. I was there for four years, and one of the tasks I had pretty much every day was to come up with a graphic for the uh, weather page that was in the back of the A section. So I had to come up with an idea that was kind of newsy and weathery and could be easily illustrated, and I would research it and write it, and I would work with an artist to actually make it look the way it's supposed to look. And so you're going to see a lot of those in the upcoming uh, notes. Now, I will mention on page 741, there is an explore activity, which has to do with uh, cans and condensing of water vapor. And so you're welcome to try this one at home. If you, ha if you don't want to try it, if you have nothing against, say, soda cans, you may not want to do it. But the, in the slide that follows, I actually have a demonstration of me crushing cans using just the air in the room and, of course, air pressure. So enjoy. And when it does, it's going to be liquid water again. I'm going to have no water vapor molecules. I'm going to have nothing pushing out. No air molecules inside the can to push out. That's what we call low pressure when there's no air molecules. Out here in the room, I still have air molecules. They're going to be pushing inward. And we're going to see who wins the fight. We're going to see what happens when we have low pressure inside and high pressure outside. Let's give her a go. crush a can. In fact, I didn't even use my hands, did I? I used the air in the room. And so remember, I created an area of low pressure inside the can. High pressure out. So no air molecules pushing out, but you have plenty of air molecules pushing in with a force of 14.7 pounds for every square inch of that can. Okay, so to just give you a big picture, you might ask yourself, why is there weather? You know, what is weather and why do we have it? Essentially, the reason why there's weather on Earth is, first of all, because the Earth has an atmosphere, and also because the Earth gets heated uh, unevenly. The Earth is tilted, and it gets its energy from the sun, but different parts of the Earth get more energy than other parts, and it turns out that Nature likes to balance things out. So weather is really just a way of balancing out the uneven, of any uneven heating of the earth via the atmosphere, via the, the, the air, and particularly the water in the atmosphere. It turns out that, uh, if you recall, water has a great heat capacity. And so it can store a lot of energy. It can go from being liquid water to water vapor. And that water vapor actually has a lot of energy stored in it. It takes a lot of energy to, to make liquid water become water vapor. And therefore, when water vapor be, goes back to being liquid water, there's a lot of energy that's released. So it's a good, it turns out that the water in the atmosphere is actually a very good vehicle for taking energy from one part of the earth and moving it to another part of the earth. So speaking of water in the atmosphere, one way that we describe water in the atmosphere is a concept called humidity. It's the amount of water vapor in a given volume of air. That's just that's just ab what's called absolute humidity. The amount of water vapor in a certain sample of air. Let's say we take a, a box of air, one meter by one meter by one meter. We can actually figure out how much water, how many water vapor molecules are in that overall volume. That's absolute humidity. More commonly used is what's called relative humidity. Now, relative humidity is not how sweaty your Aunt Betty is. It is just a ratio of the amount of actual water vapor in the air compared to how much water vapor that air could have 
at that particular temperature. So sometimes you've got a lot of water vapor in the air compared to how much possibly could be there. And sometimes you don't have very much water vapor compared to how much water vapor, water vapor could be in that air. And that would be the difference between really moist conditions and really dry conditions. So when you have really moist air, we say that it essentially has as much water vapor as it could possibly have. That is when air is saturated. And they have a little cartoon here of, of air molecules zipping around. Um, and so saturation, you can actually get as much water vapor in the air as possibly could be under those conditions if your air temperature drops. Okay, and that means essentially your air molecules start moving around more slowly. because That's what air temperature is. It's just the average kinetic energy of your air molecules. And so the water vapor in that air, as the air temperature drops, that water vapor starts to slow down. And eventually those, wa those water vapor molecules will start to stick to each other or stick to other things. And we would have what's called condensation. And this happens, um, well, let me actually go, go to this graphic. This is a graphic that I developed a couple of years ago um, when I was at USA Today, just explaining that process of uh, saturation. You know, the reason why we sweat is because our bodies get too hot. We have too much energy that is part of our bodies. We want to get rid of some of that energy, cool ourselves down. So how do we do it? Our bodies secrete water out onto our, the surface of our skin. And water, as we recall, has a large heat capacity. So that means that that water will start taking energy from our skin. So our body has too much energy. One good way of getting rid of that energy is by putting water out on the surface Therefore, the water from our, our body will, will go into, I'm sorry, the energy from our body will go into the water that's on our skin. And remember that water can take a lot of energy before the water becomes water vapor. So liquid water will, will absorb more energy, more energy, more energy. Eventually, the liquid water molecules will have so much energy that they will then evaporate. They'll go from being liquid water to the gaseous form of water. And that takes the energy then away from our bodies. However, when you have really humid air, as humidity increases, the water vapor or the water that's on our skin can't go from being liquid water to water vapor because the air surrounding your body and surrounding that water is already saturated. So, and therefore, without that evaporation going on, you don't have that cooling effect. So that, that's why in humid conditions, it feels like you're sweating, you're sweating, and you can't get that sweat off. It's because that sweat is not able to evaporate. And the reason why it can't evaporate is because the air around you is already saturated. Your book on page 743 mentions a term called dew point. Dew point is essentially the temperature uh, that you must cool a air to, uh, at which time the condensation rate in equals the evaporation rate. And so you can actually determine this. This is actually a graphic that I did a number of years ago. Um, you can actually do this on your own if you have a nice metal can and uh, you know, pour water in there, throw ice in there, stir it around, and have a, a thermometer monitoring the temperature the entire time. So um, essentially what's going to happen is your can is going to uh, cool as the because the, the water is getting cold due to the ice. And the ice is uh, taking energy away from the water as you stir it around. And so the water's getting cooler and cooler. And because the metal's in contact with the water, the metal gets cooler. And so, that, and therefore, as the can gets cooler, the air close to the surface of the can uh, gets cooler. It gives up energy to the can until eventually the air close to the surface of the can cools enough that the saturation rate for the water vapor in that air, uh, the, the, the condensation rate, uh, is equal to the evaporation rate. And so you start to get condensation on the outside of the can. And that, then when, when you watch the thermometer at the moment that start, the condensation starts to occur, that is your dew point. That is the temperature that you must cool the air to to get the condensation rate to be equal to the evaporation rate. Okay, section 312 deals with weather variables. And uh, the first thing that they, they talk about is air pressure and air pressure is a very important concept what is what is pressure if you recall this is uh, if you took physical science one we talked about pressure in i believe it was module five um, but it's force 
per unit area. And so if you imagine I've got a box here that's full of air molecules, I'm going to make them little red dots, little, little air molecules. And they're zipping around in all kinds of directions. You know, some are going this way, some are going that way. And they're going to hit the walls of the box. And when they hit the walls of the box, they're going to change direction, right? They're going to exert a force. By colliding with the box walls, they're going to, they're going to exert a little force. And if we could add up all the forces over the area of the box, we could determine the pressure. Now, let's say we heat up these air molecules. What if we, what if we turn on a burner and get them moving? By heating them up, don't we get them moving around faster? going faster and as they hit the the walls of the box by virtue of going faster aren't they going to then hit harder they're going to increase the amount of force so notice that by heating up my sample of air molecules don't i increase the pressure because the force is going to be increased because they're going to be zipping around faster or imagine what if i cut my box down in size kept the same number of air molecules in there but now i've confined them to a smaller space wouldn't that also change the number of collisions that are going to occur and therefore change the amount of force? So keep all that kind of stuff in mind when you start, when you think about what air pressure is, and uh, that's going to help guide you through the, uh, the reading on in section 31.2. It talks about adiabatic processes. Adiabatic processes uh, allow you to change the volume of the air without allowing any energy to come into the air or, or to leave it. So as you imagine this, you know, balloon or bubble full of air, and that balloon can expand or it can contract, but it's not going to be able to give any energy to the surrounding environment or take energy away from the surrounding environment. That's what an adiabatic process is. Now, in this point of the course, you've probably thought to yourself, man, this Swanson guy, he's, he's full of hot air. Well, actually, actually I am, and that will come in handy here for this little demonstration. <laughs> Okay, so imagine this is an air parcel. Now, and it's here at the surface of the Earth. Now, first of all, why does this air parcel have this particular shape? What's going on here? Yeah, why is this balloon this size? Well, remember, there's air molecules inside the balloon, and they're at a certain temperature, and they are bouncing around and hitting the, the insides of the balloon and exerting a force. They're exerting a pressure. And because this balloon is this size and this shape, that tells me that whatever the force, whatever the pressure they're exerting must be equal to <coughs> the force of the air here in the room, punching from the outside inward. So we have this, this battle between the air inside the balloon punching outward and the air outside the balloon punching inward, and we have a fair fight, and that's why the balloon takes on the shape that it does. Now imagine I allow my balloon to go up into the atmosphere, a whole kilometer, let's say. And what's the difference? Well, notice that I'd still have the guys on the inside punching outward, but a kilometer up, I've got less pressure, right? Remember we talked about air pressure and what crushed the can, right? Instead of having an entire atmosphere on top of me, uh, the weight of that column of air, 14.7 pounds per square inch, a kilometer up, there's less atmosphere on top, so it's very much like going up in a in a in a swimming pool. When you're at the bottom, boy, you feel that pressure in your ears. As you go up, you don't feel as much pressure. Why not? Less water on top of you. As my balloon goes up, there's going to be less pressure punching in from the outside because there's less atmosphere on top. We've put one kilometer of atmosphere down below us, and so now with less pushing from the outside, and yet the same number of molecules on the inside punching outward, it's going to allow my balloon to expand it's going to get bigger of course that's going to come at a cost by getting bigger by that parcel expanding it's actually doing work and getting bigger remember work is a form of energy if you recall from physical science one and therefore that air actually cools by doing work by doing mechanical work by getting bigger it actually is going to have a cool a cooler temperature and that's why we have what's called the dry adiabatic lapse rate as air ascends and as a parcel of air gets bigger by virtue of the fact that it's moving into an area of lower pressure, by getting bigger, it also cools. And in fact, it cools at a rate of 10 degrees Celsius for each kilometer rising. So therefore, you can start out with a parcel of air at 25 degrees Celsius, its surface temperature, and one kilometer up, it will have dropped 
in temperature to 15 degrees and so forth and so on, five degrees, etc., etc. That's why air gets cooler as it ascends. And also, in, in converse, that's why air warms as it descends. Okay, we're, we're going to return to this concept a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you the fact that when air is then forced to climb or to descend, uh, so for example, in, in the case of topography, when the, when the air is going over a mountain, as the air goes upward, it's going to cool. Again, according to the adiabatic lapse rate. So air is going to cool, and as air cools, as we know, it can reach saturation, in which case you're going to have condensation. So clouds are more likely to form on what's called the windward side. The, the side of the mountain that faces the wind is called the windward side. And so you're more likely to have clouds and perhaps precipitation on the windward side compared to the side that faces away from the wind, which is called the lee side. And as the air descends down the lee side, it warms. And so therefore you can wind up in some cases with something called a Chinook wind. Okay, so stable air versus unstable air. I'm going to I'm going to run a risk here. I'm going to try to draw a little graph and hopefully you can kind of imagine along with me. So I'm going to do a graph of altitude. I'm going to put A here on the Y axis and I'll put the temperature on the X axis. And so let's say that the atmosphere and we know we know that that the atmosphere gets cooler as you climb for for reasons we've just explained. So let's say the let's say we have a nice uh, graph it looks like this. So notice that as, as you're getting higher in the in the atmosphere, as your altitude increases, your temperature is decreasing. That's what the atmosphere does. Now let's say we've got a, an air parcel. I'll do it in red. And let's say my parcel, my little bubble of air, initially, notice at ground level, at altitude zero, notice that it is warmer than the temperature of the surrounding air, the atmosphere at that level. So what's it going to do? It's going to rise, and as it rises, it's going to cool. As we've, you know, again, we've ex we've explained that as air rises, it's going to expand, and as it, as it expands, it cools. And so, notice that the temperature of my parcel will decrease. But notice that no matter where I'm at, my temperature, if I compare the temperature of my parcel compared to the temperature of the surrounding air, which has also been cooling, notice that my temperature of my parcel is still warmer than my surrounding air. And therefore, I'm still in a situation where my air is unstable. As long as my rising air stays warmer than the surrounding air, it will continue to rise. So it continues on its way. And it could go on like this forever. Or perhaps at some point, my air, my, my parcel may, boom, be at the same temperature as the surrounding air. When that occurs, it's no longer unstable. I now have stable air. All right, so now keep that in mind as we talk about inversions, temperature inversions. Because in this kind of a situation, my graph doesn't look quite the same. So my atmosphere is a little different in this case. My altitude is still hung on my y-axis, and my temperature is still on the x-axis. But what happens in an inversion is that unlike the straight diagonal line that I just drew a moment ago, the air does get cooler. The atmosphere gets cooler up to a certain point. But then, somewhere along the line, it actually gets warmer with height. That's an inversion. And so now my air parcel that starts out being warmer and rises, 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 it hits this inversion layer and it can't rise anymore because now it is as at the same temperature as the surrounding air. And that's when you have stability near the surface of the of the earth and you can't get those pollutants out. They're not able to rise high enough to get away from say living areas. Um, and there, that's when you wind up with an inversion and you could wind up with smog. On page 74, 748, there's a table that talks about the different cloud groups. Pay attention if you, if, you, know, if you want to get a feel for um, the different types of clouds. Um, pay attention to some of the prefixes. When you see zero, that, is, that, that goes along with really high clouds. So again, above 6,000 meters, it's about 20,000 feet thereabouts. So these are your high clouds. And anytime you deal with a high cloud, it's going to be a zero, cirrus. Now, cirrus clouds are kind of thin and wispy um, and usually made out of ice crystals. So also keep that in mind that cirrus, not only is it high, but it's also kind of thin and wispy. You also have the prefix alto. Alto are 
kind of middle height clouds from about 2,000 meters to 6,000 meters. So they're not as high as cirrus clouds. Anytime you see an alto prefix, that means that the cloud is not quite as high in the atmosphere. And then you're, you also see associated with the alto, you see either stratus or cumulus. And notice that these, these are actually, these show up, now these are not specific of height, but actually more of just the shape. So we've already talked about cirrus being very thin and wispy. Stratus clouds are like a complete layer of cloud across the sky. So uh, you know, th when you think about overcast skies, that's a stratus kind of deck. Um, so stratus is a layer, a whole layer of cloud. Cumulus, these tend to be your little, you know, more clumps of clouds. So it's not thin and wispy and it's not an entire layer. It's maybe a clump of clouds. And quite often we think about just uh, regular cumulus clouds as being kind of those happy, puffy cotton ball clouds in the summertime. Um, so cumulus clouds tend to be kind of individual puffy clouds or, or clumps of clouds. Stratus tends to be an entire layer of cloud. And again, the alto or the zero can indicate whether is, this is a, a, a layer of cloud that's really, really high in the atmosphere, in which case it would be zero cumulus, or if it's kind of in the middle level of the atmosphere, which would be alto, I'm sorry, alto stratus or zero stratus. So zero stratus would be a, a layer way, 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 way high in the atmosphere. Alto stratus would be a layer that's a little, a little uh, lower, kind of in the middle levels. And then strato cumulus, um, or just plain old stratus would be an overcast deck. That would be like low clouds that are essentially uh, covering, you know, an overcast day would be, would be considered a stratus kind of day. So that's just kind of the basic uh, way of decoding the different types, uh, different names for clouds you're gonna wind up uh, become, coming into contact with. Okay, as we discussed before, when we did that little graph you know, with, the, with the temperature on, I'm sorry, the altitude on the y-axis and the temperature on the x-axis, uh, we saw that, that air parcels will rise as long as they are warmer than the surrounding air. The instant they, that they are the same temperature, they won't rise and you'll actually have um, condensation that will start to occur because the condensation, the, the, the parcel will become so cool that its condensation rate will meet, will equal the uh, the evaporation rate and you'll, you'll have condensation. The, the water vapor will turn into liquid water. And if you recall, water vapor is invisible. Liquid water is visible. So we can actually see those tiny little cloud droplets as clouds. And the thickness of the cloud has to do with the moist adiabatic lapse rate that will determine the thickness of the cloud. Okay, um, I'm gonna kind of zip through here. Now, this is a graphic that I did a number of years ago because you can actually sort of pay attention to contrails and get a feel for what weather might be in the offing over the next day or two because by watching contrails you can determine how dry the air is at high altitudes because we know that that uh, jets they they produce as exhaust you know hot hot air uh, and that hot air does have water vapor and as that air mixes, that water vapor mixes with much colder air, um, it will start to condense. And actually, a lot of it goes in immediately into to freezing because it's such so cold high in the atmosphere where planes are flying. They're flying at you know, 30,000 feet or so. And so it immediately forms ice crystals. If the air is really dry, those ice crystals will immediately start to evaporate. But if the air at these levels are is moister, the ice crystals will, will last for a longer time period before they evaporate. So by watching how long contrails persist, it gives you kind of a feel for how dry the air is at high altitudes. Okay, so as was just mentioned, when a when an air parcel does reach uh, its point where it's st stable and you get some condensation going on, you do have liquid, tiny little, little liquid water droplets forming. But they're, they're so, so minuscule. That's not the raindrops that we're used to, to dealing with when actually the, the water falls to the ground. Well, how do they grow? They grow in some cases by what's called collision and coalescence, which is described in your book. The tiny little water droplets actually have to run into each other. They kind of glom onto each other and get bigger and bigger until eventually they get so big that they fall out of the cloud. Now, what keeps the cloud up? Turns out our updrafts. We'll talk about the, where updrafts come from uh, in a few slides. Now we do know that that raindrops will shrink as they fall because as they drop below cloud bases, 
Now they're drive, dropping into air that may not be saturated. And so you're going to have eva this raindrop that will be evaporating more than it is condensing. And therefore, uh, it's going to get smaller. In fact, it could completely evaporate away before it reaches the ground, in which case that's a process, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon called virga. Now, one thing I wanted to, to point out, and, and this is not shown in the book here, but nothing frosts my fritters more than when I see the teardrop as, as a, you know, in, in a textbook. That's not the way raindrops look. Uh, even on weather graphics on television, you'll see a, a, a teardrop. That's not the way raindrops look. Raindrops, depending on their size, uh, are going to essentially take on a hamburger bun shape as they fall. Uh, because what's happening? The raindrop, which starts out as a sphere, will fall. As it falls, it's smacking into air molecules. And of course, it, it, what part of the air, of the of the sphere is hitting the air molecules? The bottom of the sphere is hitting the air molecules, and the air molecules are hitting back. And therefore, it's these the air molecules hitting the bottom of the sphere, which causes the bottom to deform and, and create more of like this hamburger bun shape. And as it falls, it's going to have more and more flattening is going to occur until eventually, if the uh, if the drop is big enough, it will actually split off and form two new drops, which will undergo the same process. But the, the moral of the story being never, 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 never draw a teardrop shape as the shape of a raindrop. Section 31.4 talks about air masses, and essentially what this means is that depending on, on the characteristics of your region, uh, the air from that region will have certain properties. For example, the farther north or south you are from the equator, you would expect because of less heating that those air masses, the air from those regions should be colder, right? And air that is close to a body of water, you would expect to be typically more moist uh, than air that's from say a desert region where there's not a whole lot of water. And that's essentially all that we're getting at here with this little table. And from this, uh, this graphic that's shown on page 752 of your textbook is that if air comes from, let's say, the interior of Canada, it's going to be continental polar, meaning that it's going to be relatively cool and it's going to be relatively dry. Whereas a maritime tropical air, uh, air from this region is going to be warm and it's going to be moist. Now, when air masses collide, come into contact with each other, you can get lifting because those different uh, types of air masses will have different densities. So a moist and warm air mass is going to be much less dense than a cold and dry air mass. And so when you have that collision of different density airs, uh, the, the one that is less dense is going to ride up over the one that is more dense. And so essentially you have these clashes, which are called fronts, and the potential for rising air, which then can perhaps create clouds and rainfall. Okay, if you recall, in the, Pretty sure in the beginning of these notes, I mentioned the fact that weather is really just a way of transferring energy uh, from one part of the Earth system to another. And this is really, really key. And I, I, try, I hope that it's kind of the message of this graphic. You know, why are there thunderstorms? What, what's, what's going on there? Remember, the sun is the source of energy. And the atmosphere is essentially transparent to most of the sun's energy. You know, it, the, the, the sun shines and that energy gets to the Earth's atmosphere, and most of it just passes right through. The Earth is pretty, the atmosphere is pretty much transparent to the visible wavelengths of of uh, of the sun. In fact, if it, were, if it were any other way, we wouldn't see the sun. If that light was being absorbed by the atmosphere, we wouldn't see the sun. The fact that we see the sun is is testament to the fact that most of its energy, most of the, its its uh, visible light, is just passing right through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is completely unaware. That, that light then reaches the Earth's surface and heats the surface, it heats the ground, and also heats water. And recall that water has a huge heat capacity, so it can absorb a lot of energy before it actually changes temperature. And But eventually it will, and as it changes temperature, uh, some of that water will go from being liquid water to water vapor. And so evaporation requires energy. It needs the input of energy from the sun to make water go from its liquid form to its gas form. So the water vapor actually is essentially is storing a lot of energy, a lot of that solar energy. And what happens to that energy then? 
Well, gosh, the, the water vapor then rises because it is less dense than the air around it. And as we mentioned, it gives off a little bit of energy in doing work as, the, as an air parcel expands. But where it really gives off most of the energy is when it actually condenses. So eventually that water vapor gets to the point where it cools and forms these cloud droplets. It condenses. And condensation, instead of requiring energy, it actually liberates energy. So energy is released when the water vapor goes from being in its gas form to its liquid form. And it's that energy that's released high up here in the atmosphere. Remember, the, the energy was absorbed down here at the surface and essentially was then transferred and released high in the atmosphere, a place that doesn't really receive much direct energy. And that energy release then causes air high in the atmosphere to warm and it rises as well. And you get what are called updrafts. Those updrafts help to, first of all, keep clouds up, but also if enough goes on, if enough uh, condensation is going on, you can actually get large updrafts and you can actually have storms form. So that is the, essentially what's going on. And the reason why we have thunderstorms is for energy from the Earth's surface to be transferred, and you know, that's where there's plenty of energy, to a part of the Earth system that doesn't get as much energy. So it's a way of balancing things out. Okay, so in order to have clouds and perhaps to have rain, you need to have air being lifted. So how is that done? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Convectional lifting, lifting which again, I created a graphic that helps to, to show this off. You know, think about on a, on a sunny summer day, think about how hot it gets on a parking lot compared to say a grassy area. Notice the parking lot being black, it absorbs a lot, all, those, all that energy and heats up really quickly. And of course, then the air close to the surface is going to heat up really quickly. And so you create a, a, these little parcels of air that are really warm compared to the air around, so the surrounding air. And therefore, they are going to rise. And of course, that rising air then condenses and forms clouds. So you'll get quite often cumulus clouds forming over parking lots in the summertime. And, and as the cloud then moves on, these, are, these rising parcels are called updrafts. And once the cloud moves off of an updraft, uh, it may start to dissipate because now the, you're going to get mixing and you'll have more evaporation than you do condensation and the cloud goes away. But that's essentially a convectional lifting process. The air is lifted by virtue of the fact that there's a part of the Earth's surface that is super warm and it's able to heat air. And of course, warm air is less dense than the surrounding air. Another type of um, lifting that occurs, and we, we actually touched upon this earlier, is what's called orographic lifting. So in this case, you know, air has no choice. It's, it's, it's coming in here and it hits a mountain and has no choice. It can't go into the mountain and therefore it must go up and over the mountain. And as it goes up, again, condensation occurs or, or cooling occurs and it could get to the point where it condenses. See, I actually want it with clouds here on the windward side of the mountain. And that's why windward facing uh, slopes tend to be wetter. So for example, if this was uh, Washington state, you know, think about Seattle. Seattle's rainy. Well, why is that? Because it's on the west facing sides of the Cascade Mountains. And actually in eastern Washington, it's actually almost a, a desert region because most of the, uh, the air that comes up and over, most of the water vapor that was in that air has already been turned into liquid water, which has fallen to on these east, on these western slopes. So the air that's left, the, the air that goes across the, the mountain to the eastern slopes of the Cascades and into eastern Washington uh, does not have very much water vapor. In fact, as it, as it goes down the slopes, it actually warms up, which makes it even farther away from being uh, saturated. And therefore, you have essentially a rain shadow region. So you can wind up with kind of tropical conditions, or temperate rainforest in parts of western Washington, and essentially be dealing with some desert regions in eastern Washington. So we've already talked about convective lifting. We've talked about orographic lifting, and you can also have frontal lifting. And again, we talked about these air masses and that they can have different, different uh, properties. So you can have a cold air mass that is moving, surging in to a warmer area. Remember, warmer air has less density. Colder air has greater density. So as the cold air moves in on relatively warmer air, the warm air gets lifted. And as that air gets lifted, it cools, it condenses, it forms clouds, it could form storms. So this is a cold front. Essentially, the, the, a cold front is named by the 
the type of air that's the aggressor. The air that's on the move is the cold air, and therefore this is called a cold front. A warm front is the same thing. You've got warm air now moving in toward colder air. The cold air is still more dense, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't get pushed up. It's the warm air that rides up over the cool air, and in the process, that air cools, condenses, forms clouds, forms rain. So that's a warm front because it's the warm air that's on the move there, and it actually gets pushed up over the cold air. Okay, an occluded front is essentially a, an indicator that a low-pressure system is dying. Quite often, a low-pressure system has two fronts associated with it. It has the cold front, which is usually a blue line with kind of blue triangles. Again, the, the triangles point in the direction that the cold air is moving. And it also has a warm front usually associated with it, which is usually a red line with little red half circles or little humps, again, pointing in the direction of the warm air, the motion of the warm air. And so you have really, essentially you have three air masses going on here. You've got cold air behind the cold front. You've got warm air in between the cold front and the warm front. And you have kind of cool air uh, that is to the north usually of the warm front. And so essentially what happens in, a, in an occluded front is that the cold air and the cold front catches up to the warm front. And so it actually starts to lift the warm air that has already been lifted above the cool air, if that makes any sense, and you get an occluded front. But essentially what's happening with an occluded front is that the low pressure system that created this whole thing, created those two fronts, is essentially starting to fill and it's not much, it's not gonna last much longer. Okay, so most weather aficionados, people who are really interested in weather, uh, usually are kind of fascinated with what's called severe weather, thunderstorms, tornado, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, and really, you know, tornadoes are really just a byproduct of a thunderstorm, and hurricanes are really just huge masses of thunderstorms. So really, uh, it all comes down to thunderstorms. And what are thunderstorms? Thunderstorms are really just kind of cumulus clouds that have gotten out of control. We know cumulus clouds are essentially borne by updrafts, air moving upward and condensing and forming liquid water droplets, which together get together and form clouds. When there's enough warm, warm moist air that's rising, um, all the energy, energy that is released when the water vapor condenses then causes more air to rise and you get kind of this chain reaction and you get these huge, huge cumulus clouds forming. Uh, so much, uh, so, such a large cumulus cloud, they're actually called cumulonimbus. Nimbus meaning creates rain. So these are actually uh, large enough cumulus clouds that, that they're able to create large water droplets that are able to fall to the ground as liquid rain. And of course, this is all just a way of tran transferring energy from the Earth's surface higher up in the atmosphere. So that's the energy that creates the winds. It's the energy that creates the lightning, all that kind of stuff really came from the sun originally. The sun heated the ground, which caused these air par parcels to rise. And it's the air parcels that are the middlemen. They're the ones who take the energy from the source, which is at the, at the ground level, and take it up into the atmosphere. Now, how do you create a severe thunderstorm compared to just a regular thunderstorm? Quite often, a regular thunderstorm, part of its problem is that when it starts to rain, when a cumulonimbus cloud starts to rain, it will actually cut off its energy supply. The downdrafts created by the falling rain will actually cut off the updrafts which are fueling it to begin with. So in order to have severe weather, quite often you need another thing. You need wind shear. And that means a change in either the wind direction or a change in the wind speed or quite often both. And that will help to keep your downdraft separated from your updraft. And that's a that allows the thunderstorm to live much longer than a normal thunderstorm would. So a normal thunderstorm is sometimes called a pulse thunderstorm because essentially it rains right on top of its own updraft. Whereas a supercell thunderstorm or severe thunderstorm quite often has enough wind shear that the updrafts get kind of tilted. And so when you actually have the rain part of the thunderstorm, which creates cool air and a downdraft, it is separated from the updraft. So now you can have more air coming into the storm and the downdraft does not cut off that fuel supply. As we mentioned, um, you know, when it comes to severe weather, um, we've talked about tornadoes and uh, uh, severe thunderstorms. You know, quite often you'll hear that 
that uh, terminology. A severe thunderstorm is one that could either produce a tornado, it possibly could produce a tornado, it could produce winds in excess of 60 miles per hour, or it could produce uh, hail one inch or larger. Um, so those are severe thunderstorms. All thunderstorms, doesn't have to be severe, produce lightning. Because by, by, by definition, thunder. Thunder, you can't have thunder without lightning. Lightning uh, is a superheating of the air due to an electrical current that flows from, uh, that, that flows due to a charge imbalance from the cloud to the ground, et cetera, et cetera. But the air gets superheated and we see that superheating air as a glowing plasma. That's the lightning part. And the, the air gets heated so quickly that it rapidly expands and it creates a sonic boom that we hear as thunder. And in fact, you can tell how far away a lightning strike is if you see the flash first, because the, the light travels at the speed of light. The sonic boom travels at the speed of sound, and they're much, much different. Those speeds are different. So if you count the number of seconds between when you see the flash and hear the thunder, you start counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Count as high as you need to until you hear the thunder. Then divide that number by five. So however high, high you count it. If you count it to five, divide by five. And you get the answer of one. That means that the lightning is about a mile away, the lightning you saw. So that's the way you said you can do a flash to bang uh, kind of counting. Of course, best thing to do in a thunderstorm is to be inside. When thunder roars go indoors, most lightning fatalities occur because people are outside and they're not necessarily struck directly by the lightning. Quite often they are struck by side flashes or ground currents. So uh, just a little bit of weather safety for you. Uh, of course, tornadoes are always a big concern, especially in certain parts of the country. Um, the biggest danger from tornadoes is not necessarily getting sucked up, sucked up and taken away to Oz like Dorothy in the movie, but it's actually getting hit in the head by stuff. Head trauma is the uh, most frequent cause of death in a tornado. So that's why it's always important as part of your safety plan to protect your head. Get low and get your head covered somehow. Okay, when it comes to violent weather, hurricanes are the biggest, the biggest uh, storms really, because really a, a hurricane is a big collection of storms. Whereas a, an individual thunderstorm, you know, maybe just an individual, you may have a cluster of thunderstorms. Uh, a tornado can develop from a single thunderstorm or perhaps from a multi-cell sort of cluster. But hurricanes quite often are, are big, big clusters of storms that are you know, up sometimes hundreds of miles in diameter. Um, they usually form over warm ocean waters, usually during the warm season in the northern hemisphere. So that's from June to about October is kind of the, the peak hurricane season. In fact, the peak of hurricane season typically is from like late August into mid-September is when you have the greatest frequency of, of uh, hurricane formation. Of course, hurricanes are the strongest manifestation of a tropical low pressure system. As the low gets stronger, it becomes a tropical depression. And then as it gets stronger still with increased wind speeds, it becomes a tropical storm and eventually uh, is classified as a hurricane if the winds are strong enough. The winds are, are one factor that cause damage on the, uh, on the shoreline. Another damage uh, maker is the storm surge. The fact that the hurricane creates a mound of water just due to due to pressure purposes and then it actually just pushes that water ashore especially the right front quadrant of most hurricanes is the uh, the most damaging part of the hurricane because it's pushing water on shore uh, by the strong winds and uh, so usually you'll get the highest uh, amount of coastal flooding in that right front quadrant of the hurricane Meteorologist Bob Swanson is standing by the Storm Center with the latest from Live Viper 11. Bob, what do you think? Will this sunny weather continue? Yes, indeed, at least for uh, Monday. Monday looking A-OK, -okay, Bill. Very uh, sort of a continuation of our weekend weather with plenty of warm temperatures and a fair amount of sunshine. However, some rain returns to the forecast by Tuesday. But until then, it's going to be fairly nice. Very quiet out there right now. Let's go to Storm Team Live Viper 11 and give you an idea as to what's happening around the Tri-Cities region. We are sweeping our four area radar sites. Some of our radar sites just picking up on a little bit of ground clutter out of our Jackson site as well as uh, Greer, South Carolina. But otherwise, things are very quiet. Going to take the sweeps off and just zoom you in a little bit closer just to show you some of the great imagery. It's a clear night. We're going to take you into to, uh, Jonesboro in the vicinity of the Jonesboro Storytelling Center just along a, 
uh, historic uh, Main Street there in Jonesboro. And again, just very quiet. And again, this is some fantastic imagery that we have available as part of the Viper package. And again, we are going to see clear skies overnight with a fairly nice start to your Monday, generally in the lower or upper 40s, lower 50s. And then we should warm up into the upper 70s, lower 80s by the afternoon. However, rain has returned to the forecast, at least by Tuesday. We'll have details about that coming up in just a couple of minutes. Storm Team 11 meteorologist Bob Swanson holds the seal of approval by the American Meteorological Society. Well, this is the end. My final uh, weather cast with WJHL and uh, sort of glad that we had such a beautiful weekend. Very, very quiet. A beautiful Mother's Day. Hope all the moms enjoyed a beautiful Sunday. Let's go to Storm Team Live Viper 11 uh, to show you what's happening across the plains. Not nearly as nice across portions of our nation's midsection, anywhere from the Dakotas down through Kansas, seeing a lot of thunderstorm activity, all in association with an area of low pressure. We can see this counterclockwise spin in the atmosphere. That is providing some of the uh, thunderstorms, some of the biggest thunderstorms across portions of southeast Kansas at the moment. But as we take you a little bit closer to home, we are looking at the Tri-Cities Airport. And again, very quiet and great imagery, courtesy of storm Team Live Viper 11. Let's go to the maps and show you another look at the uh, Tri City Regional Airport. Temperatures dipping back into the upper 40s to near 50 degrees by morning. Generally clear skies and rather calm winds out there this evening. Very quiet for most of the southeast. Notice uh, not a whole lot in the way of cloud cover or rainfall. Most of it is off to our west across portions of uh, the Mississippi Valley, just across the Mississippi, across portions of Missouri, down into Louisiana, and then further back into the Plains states. Some of the temperatures around the region, very comfortable. Mill McMillan and Rose Tester in Mountain City, 51 degrees. The Ryder family at 54 in Roan Mountain. Tony Shaver's got 64 degrees in Bristol. Want to thank all the weather watchers that I've talked to over the past three years. Gotten to know some of these folks very well, and they are very a very dedicated bunch calling in their temperatures every day, several times a day. Hallie Bennett's got 65 in Church Hill, a high to the Frost family as well in Church Hill and Mount Carmel. 63 in Geneva Wilson in Greenville. Roby Hensley, 63 in Chucky. And Ruth Green, big Braves fan, uh, 55 right now in Flag Pond, Tennessee. Temperature, uh, the situation around the region, pretty quiet. The reason being, we still have high pressure in command across the southeast. That's keeping skies mostly clear for the Tri-Cities. That high is going to slide off to the east during the day tomorrow, allowing a little bit more cloud cover late in the day. I think most of Monday is going to be very nice with fair, a fair amount of sunshine, very mild temperatures. But notice that storm system off to our west will be our weather maker for Tuesday, bringing us clouds, rain showers. Can't even rule out a thunderstorm or two during the day on Tuesday. 57 right now at the Tri-Cities Airport. The pressure holding steady at 30. 0.02 today, Mother's Day, a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. 81 our daytime high, that is well above normal. 73 is our normal for this time of the year, so we're finally above normal as far as temperatures go. 10 degrees shy of the record set back in 1940. And for the month of May, it has been dry. Just a trace of rainfall officially at the Tri Cities Airport with about an inch of a def deficit rainfall wise on the year. 48 your forecast low by morning, going for a high of around 83 by tomorrow afternoon with winds out of the southwest. And again, a fair amount of sunshine helping out with the uh, the warming for tomorrow and all in all a fairly mild seven day forecast temperatures still staying in the upper 70s lower 80s but rain is back in the forecast mainly on tuesday could linger into wednesday and then just slight slight chance for afternoon showers thursday and friday then another round of showers and thunderstorms possible by next weekend wanted to also show up show off a couple of photos uh, that was Joe Reedy, our Irwin weather watcher he came in for a tour on friday and always good to see joe joe is a senior at a the Unicoi High School, and he has a promising future in meteorology. He's heading off to school to study meteorology, and that's been one of my missions while I've been here is to get out and uh, talk to a lot of students and uh, kind of educate about the weather and hopefully inspire some. And another group that was well, part of Joe Reedy's group was uh, the Unicoi uh, the, yeah, High School Valley Beautifuls pre-college chapter of the American Meteorological Society that made me a great little poster there. <laughs> and uh, thank, thank all of them and hope that they all have uh, perhaps promising careers in meteorology. It's been a lot of fun to be here the last three years. Now you've also, uh, you've entertained but educated a lot of, a lot of children. Some children and yeah. some, some community groups. I'm talking to the Sunshiners tomorrow at noontime at, uh, again, Unicoi County okay. Methodist Church. All right. Thanks a lot, Bob. Okay, so I showed you earlier in, the, in this video uh, some footage of me doing a weather cast, or you may have put up with listening to watching all that. Maybe you didn't. Um, but how do forecasters actually forecast the weather? It takes data, first of all. Uh, you get data either from surface reports, meaning that at, at every airport across the country and through many airports around the world, there are uh, weather stations that are recording the temperature, the pressure, the dew point, the wind speed, the relative humidity, all that kind of stuff. You're getting a lot of data on the ground. Plus, meteorologists launch weather balloons twice a day from about 100 
locations around the U.S. Uh, that are constantly getting new information about the temperature, the wind speed, wind direction, humidities, pressures um, throughout the atmosphere. So you're finding out, you're getting these snapshots of what's happening at the surface, as well as snapshots of what's happening in the atmosphere. All that information then gets put into computer models. And computer models are just really fancy systems of equations which approximate, using fluid dynamics, how the atmosphere should react. Given this initial set of conditions, what will things look like in 12 hours? What will things look like in 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours, etc.? That's how the forecast is created. So that's what computer models are, just fancy systems of equations. And of course, there are so many variables that the farther out in time you get, the less likely the forecast is to come to pass. But essentially, that's what weather forecasting is all about. Now, now that you know all this stuff, uh, one thing you can do is you can read station models. You can, and these are, this is what I mentioned, you know, every airport around the country has a reporting station. And that reporting station gives temperature, humidity, dew point, um, wind speed, wind direction, pressure, all that kind of stuff, the, the trend in pressure. And that is concisely written using a station model. And so this skills test actually helps you to read a weather map that has little station models on it and decode some of that information. Your lab activity is going to help you put everything together. It's going to, to uh, show you some satellite imagery and some radar imagery. because That's another thing that weather forecasters use, is they use radar. They use satellite images to get a feel for what's going on, what might go on in the future. So uh, again, make sure you read, watch the, the video. It'll kind of help you step through the isobars, winds, and radar satellite imagery lab activity. And of course, wrapping it all up, here are your readiness assurance test answers for chapter 31.